All right, I think we are ready. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you that we can come together this evening, Lord, just to look to your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we are trying to learn how to just um, be biblical parents in this modern world, Lord, just uh, being able to raise our children in a godly way that they have a desire to serve you. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this time. Again, give us the Holy Spirit's power, Lord, that we might be able to look into your word and, Lord, just learn some things that might help us. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful for who you are. I thank you for Jesus and just for the way that he loves us and pray that you'd bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yeah, so uh, whether we know it or not, we all have a parenting style. Um, some good, some not so good. Um, in addition to having a style, that style can change over time and depending on circumstances. Um, obviously, if you have more than one child, children are different. And so you might have to parent your children a little bit differently as you, as you kind of adjust. Um, personalities are different. Um, ages makes a difference. Um, but there are some general rules for, for parenting when it comes to a style. We're going to look at some of that tonight. Um, does the Bible show anything? Oh, sure it does. Um, and that's where we're kind of the direction head, uh, we're going to head. Um, our parenting style will influence our children's future. Um, Steve Carr said, every person has a plan and method which they use to parent, even if it's not defined. You may use the method your parents used in parenting or you find one that you've chosen for yourself. No matter the source, your parenting style, you must understand that it will Um, dramatically affect your decision-making with your children and their lives in real ways. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to jump ahead too much, but yeah, the way we parent really can make a big difference, and especially if you're, especially if you got, I mean, you got that strong, (laughs) strong strong-willed child, and you're using the wrong parenting style, boy, you're setting yourself up for some really difficult days. (laughs) I had to learn that the hard way. yeah, my, my, my third, my youngest, I've shared, and he knows it. Um, he was one of those strong-willed children that, man, I think I tried every parenting style and still came out going, what am I doing? Um, but we can follow God's word, and, and, and it'll lead us to a place where we can understand. Psalm chapter 78, verse 4 says, We will not hide them, speaking of the law from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he hath established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Take the generation to come to know them, that even the children which should be born, who arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Um, We're we're looking for results. Um, uh, But but what is the final goal in, in raising our children? I mean, any thoughts? What's our final goal for raising our children? To love Christ. Yeah, to love him, to serve him, right? Um, in the end, they'll be saved. Yeah, for sure, um, definitely. Um, and somebody said, parents are the unique role of helping their children discover how God has equipped them and how he can use them and their gifts in positive ways as an adult. I mean, that's what we want our children to discover is, I mean, we're all here for a purpose, you know, and God has a plan for every person. And we want to be able to help our children and guide them to a place where they understand their purpose in God's plan. Um, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do, but at the same time, it was just like, that's what, that's what the goal is. I think that kind of takes us back to the Great Commission. Um, and I've shared this before, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Uh, the Great Commission is not just for other people, it's for our children too. Um, and it's not just about leading them to Christ, but it's in discipling them, raising them up so that way they know they're observing us. That's a big key. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, I mean, that's a big key is they're observing us. We're trying to show them and disciple them and teach them all the things that God has shown us. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's one of our biggest roles as a parent, discipling our own children. I mean, you know, here we, we, I, we neglect our children. We got a big problem. Um, Actually, the, the Bible says if you can't take care of your own house, you've got no business taking care of the house of God. And so it's just like, so we have to make sure that we are, we're striving to make sure that our children are in a place where they're following God. And how they do that? By following us. Um, we're not in this alone. 
Amen. Um, God gives us instruction that we may pass on to our children. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Um, but, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Um, God's the one that gives us the grace and the ability to parent biblically in a way that honors him. Um, Paul David Tripp said, You must be committed as a parent to the long view, parenting, because change is a process, not an event. Uh, we've talked about that long, uh, the, the, the long goal. Um, <laughs> it's not an overnight thing. Um, you know, it's just like my oldest is 40 years old. I still have a hard time saying that. She's 40 years old. Um, I, I have grandchildren that are teenagers. <laughs> I pray for my children. <laughs> They need it. Um, teenagers, something else. But, I mean, in the long view, I noticed something else in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. It says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the lie of thy mother. I think there's something here. There's an underlying thought here that Solomon recorded. Um, we got to make sure that as a couple, we're on the same page. Okay? I was just like, um, man, kids are good at discovering when mom and dad are not on the same page. And when mom and dad are not on the same page, they learn real quick how to manipulate. Real quick. Um, if parents aren't in agreement, children are not foolish. I mean, I mean, we're talking, I mean, little ones, different story, but when they start to get to a point where they can kind of observe, they'll, they'll, they'll discover real quick if you're not on the same page. And they will, um, they will take advantage of that. They really will. Um, they could sense when parents are different, or differ, or differ in the way they, they parent. And, and it's just like, we've got to be on the same page. Um, my youngest, he tried. <laughs> um, and I thank God me and my wife were on the same page. Well, we were both kind of raised in a similar style. Both of us had deaf parents, and so it was just like our parents were good friends. And so we were kind of raised in the same style, so we had kind of the same thoughts. And so he tried. I mean, he would, you know, you know, you, you know how kids are. They, they come to you and say, well, Dad, can I? And, and you go, no. And, he, and so what does he do? He turns around and goes over to Mom and says, Mom, well, can I? And Mom would say, what did Dad say? Because she already knew, you know, so it's like, or vice versa. Um, you, we got to be on the same page. I mean, I think this all goes back to the idea of marriage. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and two shall be one flesh. Um, I mean, there's a good chance that maybe you weren't raised in the same way. Um, and it's really good to have that conversation about how are we going to raise these children? Get on the same page. Um, my youngest struggled with that when he first got married. They had totally different ideas of how to parent. Um, <laughs> we'll look ahead of this. He was a totalitarian. I mean, he was my way. You know, and she was more, eh, you know, just let, them, let, let the kids be kids. You know, it's just like... Well, you talk about playing off each other. Now, they've figured that out, and they've kind of adjusted. Like I said, you have to. Um, it, not only is it bad for us as parents, but it can be bad for the kids. You can create um, anxiety for children. If you've got parents that aren't on the same page, the kids don't know. They don't know what to expect. You know, it's just like, and so, um, Mark chapter 3, verse 25, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We've got to be on the same page as parents. Um, you know, dad says, oh, you, know, you can go ahead and do this now. Just make sure mom's not watching. Or mom says, oh, it's okay as long as dad doesn't find out. Yeah, and they pick up on that. They pick up on that quick. Um, both situations, what, what's happened, you have actually undermined the authority of your husband or wife. And now the kids are saying, mm, yeah, I can take advantage of that, and they'll play on it. I just get Kids are little sinners at heart. <laughs> you know, it's just the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked, right? And that, that includes our kids, okay? Um, but we now undermine the authority of our parent. What are the keys? Um, never, and I, I'll say this again, never undermine the authority of your spouse in front of your children. If you're standing there and mom says no, you back her up. Whether you agree or not, you can have that discussion later. You never undermine, undermine the authority of your spouse in front of your children. You do that, and you, you, you've lost a major, major battle, okay? Um, it's key. It's just like, 
Your dad doesn't know what he's talking about. It's fine. You've just made your husband look like a fool. Yeah, the house divided cannot stand. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like, I mean, either way, you know, well, your mom, you know, just, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Don't worry about it. What have you just told your child about your mom? That your mom knows nothing? I, we, 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 I mean, you can disagree. Just don't do it in front of the children. You have that discussion later. And that's that second part. If you do disagree, discuss it later. Take that aside. You know, for now, leave it. Come back to it. But for now, take it aside. Just let it be. And then we discuss it later. Um, it's, Jenny Hill says it's not always possible to agree with one another. But even if we don't agree, we can still back each other up. Hey, it's like I said. I mean, I, like I said, I, I consider myself to be very fortunate that I, my wife was raised very similar to the way I was. Um, her parents, same as my parents, um, kind of interesting. Our moms did all the discipline. I, I grew up in a time where dad went to work and earned the money. Mom took care of the kids. I mean, mom, my mom never worked. She was a stay-at-home mom her whole life. I mean, she worked before she got married, but then once she got married and started having kids, she never went back to work, never. Dad was alone, went to work. Mom raised the kids. Mom was 5'2 and carried a very firm stick. <laughs> yeah, I remember that stick well. Um, I, I can actually remember only being disciplined by my dad one time. One time. Um, I, I will tell this story because I think it's, anyway, people laugh. Um, I grew up in a bowling alley. Um, that was big for the deaf culture. Um, I was at the bowling alley probably three, sometimes four nights a week because bowling's the perfect sport for deaf people. Because you get up there, you throw the ball, and you go back, and you get to talk for 10 minutes. It was the perfect sport. They loved it because, you know, when you get together, you could, back then, you couldn't just pick up a phone and call. Obviously, they're deaf, and we didn't have video. So you couldn't, and so they would get together, and one of the big places was the bowling alley. So we were at the bowling alley three nights a week. Well, there used to be an old bowling alley down on Halsey Street. It used to be called uh, Timber Lanes. Then it changed to Hollywood Bowl. I, now I think it's a lumber shop. But anyway, that bowling alley had, had a water fountain, a little beautiful water fountain. That's where I proposed to my wife in front of this water fountain. Anyway, we lived there. I was just like, so this water fountain came down. Well, like I said, I grew up back in the 70s. Um, well, back then, people used to smoke in the bowling alleys. It was just like, and they used to keep matches on the counter. So we got the bright idea one night, me and my brothers and sisters, to go snatch some of those matches. And we were sitting there throwing the matches, lighting them and throwing them up in the fountain and watching them come down. We got caught. Manager came over and drug us over to mom and dad. Mom had a saying when we got in trouble out in public. This is what mom would say, I'll fix you later. Yep. Mom would say, I will fix you later. We knew we were in big trouble when mom said that. This time, dad said, I'll fix you later. Dad had never said that before. We thought, oh man, we're in big trouble. So we get home. Dad sits down in his chair and says, all right, line up. Well, I'm the youngest of the four, so I'm in the back. I have no idea what's going to happen. Dad brought home a book of matches. I'm watching. My sister's the oldest. She gets up there, and, and Dad tells her, put out your finger. Dad, little match, and burned her finger. Says, you play with matches, you get burned. Uh, I'm not liking this much. So sister goes off, and she's like, mm, right? Older brother goes next. Third brother, and I'm out there going, how do I fight this? And I was like, oh, got an idea. Dad's not looking. <laughs> there was only one problem I didn't anticipate. My finger turned black. Theirs didn't. So dad goes, what did you do? So then I'd tell him, so I got burned twice. So it's just like, that's the only time I ever remember dad disciplining me. It's just like mom was the one that would discipline. Um, but that's just the time that I grew up in. But now with my wife and myself, we're both there. And so we, got to be, we had to be on the same, same page. Um, it's just it's so important. Um, it helps us to identify the kind of peristyle, parenting style we're using. And like I said, adjust if necessary. The Bible is filled with examples, and that's where we're going to kind of go tonight. Um, and we'll start with what I've called the passive parent. Some call it the permissive parent. Um, this is the parent really doesn't do what's necessary in training their children. 
They know the child's doing wrong, but they don't do anything to correct the behavior. Um, I think a, a, a really sad example is Eli um, as a priest. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, Elkanah went to Ramah, to his house, and the child did minister to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Interesting note, Eli's sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, sons of Belial. It's an interesting word when you look it up. Um, some say Belial. I looked it up and I went to, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Andrew Scurby, the English guy that does all the speaking Bibles. He says Belial, so I'll go with what he says. But anyway, uh, the idea is that they are worthless, without profit. Um, these were priests in the service of the Lord. And it's, the Bible says that they were without profit. Why do I find this so interesting? Um, when Hannah went to pray, because she was, couldn't have a baby, she went to pray, and Eli thought she was drunk, okay? Um, what's interesting is what Hannah responds with. Eli accuses her of being drunk, and she says, Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Um, at this time, all of Israel knew about Eli's two sons. They knew. Um, these two sons were wicked. Yeah, plain and simple, they were wicked. Um, and so I think that when she said that, that had to have um, stung just a little bit with Eli because that's what everybody said about his two sons. And she's saying, I am not like that. Um, the Bible describes that they were taking advantage of the sacrifices, taking more than was what their right were as priest. Um, and Eli was a willing partaker. It's not like he said, no, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not, no, he partook. Um, it came to the point where the people despised the sacrifice of the offerings. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 17, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. People started to hate going to the tabernacle because of these two. Um, and where does the burden lie? With Eli. Um, not only were they doing that, but they were using the tabernacle as a house of prostitution. This is, I mean, it's just crazy to think about. These were the priests of God. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did to Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the, uh, the congregation of the tabernacle. What did he do about it? Nothing. It was a very small rebuke. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 23, this is what he said. He said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for there is no, no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. That's it. That's all. I mean, I think Eli needed a little more than what we're given here. Um, maybe time for a little rod of correction. Uh, yeah, they were adults, which leads me to believe what happened when they were younger. He's passive. He's permissive. He's not stopping the behavior. Um, bottom line for Eli, uh, it's not good. What was the problem? God told him, he says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefs of all the offerings of the Israel my people. It's just like God flat out told him, what are you doing? You have put your children above me, God, by allowing them this behavior. Um, you know, when we allow our children to, to run around, I mean, just... And, and, and we don't take care of the discipline, we don't take care of the behavior, and, and we're, we're not going to a place of trying to correct that behavior. We've now placed them above God, is what the Bible says. Um, general traits. Most discipline is verbal. <clears throat> and then a lot of times it's warning, and then warning, and then warning, and then warning, but there's no follow-through on the warning, okay? Uh, kids will learn that quick, too. Yeah, they've heard it all before. Um, 
uh, somebody said if a child screams long enough and loud enough, they'll get their way with the passive parent. <laughs> this one, my son Brandon, who was deaf, uh, he had this when he was probably about, mm, I have to think about this, 1991. So he had to be about six or seven years old, six or seven years old. By this time, we already knew he was deaf. Um, he used to throw fits. I mean, it was just like a temper tantrum. And when we were at home, he would just throw himself down on the floor, sit right down and throw himself back. Wham! Slam his head into the floor. Of course, it's a wood floor, so it would kind of bounce a little bit. And he had it figured out to where he could do it just enough to where it didn't hurt, but it made a lot of noise. And he could feel it in the floor. Well, then we got saved, and we came to church. Not here. i got to get over here. Solid cement floor. That's a solid cement floor. Over here, there's wood because there used to be a baptismal over here. Solid cement floor. The first time he threw a temper tantrum in the church, he sat down and went wham, and we heard crack. And his eyes got this big around, and he looked up, and then he just screamed. That was the last temper tantrum he ever threw. Scream long enough, loud enough, you get what you want. Um, I mean, I, I, I think we've probably all experienced the little kid in the store screaming at mom, I want that something, right? I know I've seen it, and I'm just like, oh, please, mom, do something. Dad, yeah, it's just like, I got a belt. You want to borrow it? You want to borrow my belt? It's just like, I mean, um, as the adults, we are the ones who set the stage for vitality, love, or disharmony in the home. We set ourselves up for one another, and our children take their cues from us. If we're going to allow and allow and allow, they're going to know it. Um, what ends up happening, the child runs the home. Um, Samson. Um, his parents indulged him to the point where they had no control. Um, all he ever did was live for his flesh. I mean, we're talking about tremendous potential. He was anointed. As a judge of Israel, he was anointed. He had so much potential, and he threw it all away for the flesh, and his parents, by this time, couldn't stop couldn't stop him. Um, uh, in Judges chapter 14, verses 1, it says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of the Timnath and the daughter of the Philistines. Okay, we got a problem already. He says, And he came up and told his father, his mother said, I've seen a woman in the Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. <laughs> She's a Philistine. Why are you down there? Then his father and mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people that thou goest to take wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. And guess what happened? It's the permissive parent. So, I mean, you think about Samson for a moment. Samson was a miracle child. Honestly, he was a miracle child. Mrs. Manoah, we don't know her name, Mrs. Manoah. She couldn't have children. This was a miracle. She's going to have a baby. And they started good. Don't get me wrong. They started good. In Judges chapter 13, verse 12, Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we do unto him? So they asked, Lord, how do we raise him? That's awesome. That's a, that's a prayer every parent should, should pray. Um, how do we raise him? But somewhere along the line, we, we took a left turn, and they just started indulging him and gave him whatever he want. And then we, then we don't have problems. No, 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 you have bigger problems now. I mean, a, a little discipline and a little firmer hand might have helped a lot. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul de de despair for his, his crying. Uh, <laughs> yep, they're going to cry. It's not a bad thing. Um, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. This is really a lesson on discipline. We'll talk about that later. Um, but I, I'm not saying that we have to beat our children every day. I'm not saying that. But there are, is time and there is a place where we need a little sterner correction. A little time out. It sometimes doesn't work. Um, sometimes discipline has to hurt. Okay? Um, but if we don't, we're going to have a problem. 
Um, and this comes from God himself. I mean, Proverbs chapter 3, verse, verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. I mean, it, it, it's not mean to discipline your children. It's just the opposite. It's love that causes us to discipline our children, to lead them in the right way. By allowing them to do these things, man, we're just, we're just making children that, I mean, I think we're seeing what the benefit of that is now with all these kids that are, the things that are happening in our world. Uh, just like, <laughs> I think some of these protesters probably need a good spanking. Straighten up. Um, Anne Lamott said, one thing I know for sure about raising children that every single day a kid needs discipline but also every single day a kid needs a break. As with God and all things, there's got to be a balance. I'm not saying that every little thing they do, we've got to pull out the rod and beat them with it. I'm saying there's, we've got, there's got to be an equal measure. There's got to be a balance to what the offense is. But if we just allow them in the passivity, we're not helping them and we're not helping ourselves. Um, we have a second one is the uninvolved parent. Um, I, I kind of went to David as an example here. Um, I actually read a book one year. I can't even remember who the author was. It says, How David Failed as a Parent. Um, and one of the things was he was so busy running around being king and being, you know, the, the leader of the military and this, that, and the other that he had no time for his kids. Uh, you know, I understand we have to make a living. I get that. Um, but we also have to make time for the children. Uh, David said, had, it says David had at least six wives and 19 sons. And that doesn't count the daughters not mentioned other than Tamar. Um, and we see the struggle in David had dealing with his children. Um, he had a son named Adonijah who tried to usurp the throne. Um, if we don't hear a lot about it other than that. He tried to usurp the throne. First Kings chapter 1 verse 5, Then Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father, this is interesting phrasing, his father had not displeased him at that time in saying, why hast thou done so? He was also a very goodly man. His mother bare him after Absalom. In other words, that word where it says where his father had not displeased him, saying that David did nothing to stop him. Didn't rebuke him, nothing. He's trying to usurp the throne and David just let it happen. He's just not involved. He's just not there. I mean, it's just like, it says... <laughs> There was no discipline, no words at all from David. I mean, it's not just passivity. He's just not involved. Um, we see the same thing with Amnon and Tamar. Amnon rapes his sister. What did David do? Nothing. Nothing. So Absalom takes it upon himself to do something and kills his brother. What did David do? Nothing. Absalom runs for a while. Does David communicate with him? Not a word. Finally encourages him to come home because it says that David was grieving for him, brings him home for two years. Absalom's back in town. David doesn't go see him. Doesn't bring him back to visit with him. Not two years. He's just not involved. He's just not there. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 28, Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. I mean, David went out of his way to bring him home and then doesn't go see him. Right. And then finally, he's just not involved. I mean, it's just like when there's two parents in the home, they need both. OK, it, it, I, like I said, I grew up in a different time. Dad was not the disciplinarian. Dad was there. Don't get me wrong. And we had family vacations and things like that. But it was mom that did everything with the kids, you know. But but kids need two parents. I understand one of us has got to work at least. We got to make a living. Um, and nowadays, many times both parents are working. We still have to make time and be there for our kids. Um, I think I shared this already. I worked for a company named Arch Aluminum and Glass. I went in there as a truck driver and just going to drive truck for a while. And uh, one of the, the other bosses, uh, he asked me if I would kind of help with one of the departments because I had a lot of experience working for another glass company. I said, sure, no problem. I'll help out. So I kind of helped out, organized, got them set up to where they could run through their, their processes and production a little bit faster because they just weren't doing I mean, it was, it was crazy what they were doing. But anyway, so I kind of straightened them out. And so got them working. So between driving my truck, running this department, I was already working about 50 hours a week. Not bad. Then they asked me to take over the dispatch position because the dispatcher was going to quit. He was going to work for another company. I was like, well, sure. But then they still wanted me to run this department and occasionally drive the truck. 
Now we're looking at 60 to 70 hours. Then on Saturdays, we had to go in and clean all of the equipment because it was a glass company, we're making windows. And so now I'm down there on Saturdays for about four hours to six hours every Saturday morning. So, I mean, I was spending more time there than anywhere else in my life. And I still had the ministry on top of that. My wife's a very uh, gentle soul. I got home one day and she looked at me and says, I don't like your job. That's all she said. I don't like your job. Okay, I'll find a new one. <laughs> and I did. What she was trying to tell me is I'm not home. My kids needed me. At that time, my kids, my boys were teenagers. They needed dad at home. And she needed me at home. Um, like I said, we, we go through changes. Um, children are a blessing. And we have to be there for them. I, I, I changed that. I did. Uh, I tried to be there for my boys as much as possible. Um, my oldest son, Brandon, he played basketball in high school. I was his interpreter. I wanted to be there at every game. Uh, my youngest son, Tony, ended up being a wrestler. I wrestled in high school, too. So it's just like, I want to be there for every, every, every match. You know, it's just like, be involved, be involved, be involved. I played soccer when I was in school. Dad never once came to a game. Never once. Mom was there every time. And so it's just like, so it's just like personal experience on both ends of it. Um, but our children need us there. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. It's a blessing to be a parent. It is a blessing to be a grandparent. Um, Hold on to your kids. A book written by Gordon Neufeld and Gaber Mate says, The most important gift we can give our children is our attention, our presence, and our genuine interest in their lives. Um, yeah. We have to be involved. Uh, next, we come to the overprotective parent, um, also known as the helicopter, helicopter parent. Watching every move. Making sure they never get hurt. Uh, problem is, these parents live in fear um, of what could happen. Um, that's not living. Bible says, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Um, I'm kind of trying to think about this. I kind of felt like Sarah might have been this overprotective mother. Um, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 9, that Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast this bondwoman out and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous at Abraham's sight because of his son. Um, she's a mom. She's trying to protect her son. But man, she went over the top. This was her plan. This was her plan. To help God. Because God was taking too long. So she gave Hagar to her husband, says, here, have a son by her, and it will be my son. And then when she finally had her own son, well, now, no, no, no we got to get this one. He's mocking my son. A little bit overprotective is what I see it. Um, what happens to a helicopter child? No confidence. Um, afraid to make decisions. Fear of the unknown. Um, many times depression. Anxieties. And they become dependent on everybody else for everything they need. And so it's just like the overprotective parent. Um, I, I think we can kind of see that a little bit in Isaac. Uh, when Rebecca finally comes, he, he didn't even go find his own wife. Now, I know that was Abraham's play, but he didn't go find his own wife. When she comes, it, when you read about Isaac and Rebecca, it kind of seems like she kind of ran the house. And he was just there. Um, and so it's just like, so we have this, so from Sarah's protection or overprotection, he just kind of, is just kind of skating through life. Um, helicopter parenting behavior we saw included parents constantly guiding their child by telling him or what to play with, how to play with a toy, how to clean up after playtime, and being too strict or demanding. Kids reacted in a variety of ways, became defiant. Others were apathetic and some showed frustration. They actually did a study where they were watching parents with their children. And these helicopter parents, yeah, this is what they saw. Um, children have to grow up. Sometimes that hurts. Um, James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse, diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. Uh, we need to fail sometimes. It needs to hurt sometimes. 
Um, that's how we learn. Um, Abraham Lincoln said success is 99% failure. Uh, I was already joking with Mr. Flippo back there. Maya Angelou said, if you're not in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? I said, I'm always in over my head. <laughs> um, but what I find interesting is the contrast between Sarah and Abraham. Abraham was told to go and sacrifice his son. What did he do? He didn't run the other way. He went. Faith, not fear. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise, offered up his only begotten son. He didn't run away in fear. He did what God told him. Um, now, I understand there has to be some wisdom in protection. Common sense has to prevail. Um, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, Take ye that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Um, when I was in school, elementary school went up to sixth grade, and then we had junior high. We didn't have middle school back then. We had junior high school, so that was seventh through ninth grade, and then high school was only 10th through 12th. So when I hit seventh grade, I couldn't wait because we got to go up to the junior high school, and that's when they had sports, after-school sports. I love sports. And so I told Dad, I'm going to play football. I was four foot seven and weighed 65 pounds. Yeah. Dad said, how about we find another sport? I don't want to pay the hospital bills. He's probably a, a good choice, um, but sometimes protection is necessary. Um, a little bit of wisdom. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not a good idea. I pro probably the equipment probably weighed more than I did. Um, yeah, it would have been bad. I would be falling over like this. It's just like, um, but protection, it's got to be within a balance again. Um, then you have what's next is the totalitarian parent. My way or the highway. I am the king or the queen of the castle. Uh, Saul ruled his house with an iron fist and ended up losing the respect of his own son. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 20, verses 31, said Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, Thou son of the perverse and rebellious woman, do I not know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and to the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger, did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Um, whew, that's rough. I mean, he left the table in fierce anger at his father because his father was just... Um, the totalitarian is, is this idea that children are to be seen and not heard. And so it's old school. Um, my rules are to be made without question. Now, it's not always wrong, but it's not always right either. Um, there's no relationship. That's not a relationship. I command you do. That is not a relationship. Um, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Um, James Dobson said, Rules without relationship will always equal rebellion. Um, <laughs> man, this one. I tried it all. I tried the to man, he'd just get mad. He's just like, he just, try, just trying to come to church sometimes. He'd get up in the morning and get ready for church. He's not ready. He's like, what are you doing? We're going to church. I'm not going. No, we're going to church. That includes you. Get the car. But I have dandruff. I don't really care. Let's go. I said so, let's go. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just like, what, happened, what, did he end up, what did that end up doing? He rebelled even harder. I mean, he was just, I mean, he just, he starts digging his feet in. And so it's just like, and so it's just finding that balance. Um, it's just like, and then you try the passive thing. Oh, okay, just stay home. Well, that did work. <laughs> okay, great. Now I know I can stay home. <laughs> it's just like, man, finding that balance. You wait till those kids get over. You'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Especially when they get to be teenagers. Uh, yes. Um, what? Thanks for the encouragement. 
I'm just trying to prepare you, man. <laughs> I'm just preparing you for reality. Um, but yeah, I, the, the totality parent thinks I have to be in control of everything. Um, well, God's the one that has to be in control. Okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, Furthermore, we have, heard, or we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, so we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father's spirits and live? Uh, anger, yelling, threats only produce a temporary change. Why? You haven't changed the heart. Um, that's where the true change is made. Uh, Solomon um, in Proverbs says, My son, give me thine heart. And let thine eye observe my ways. So rather than my way, hey, show them in a loving way and be the example. Um, you know, if our heart's right, we're walking with God. That totalitarian or that, that controlling parent disappears. We find a balance between love and discipline. Um, Hebrews 12, 11, Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Um, Josh Billing says, To bring up a child in the way he should go, travel that way yourself once in a while. So I'm saying, we got to be the example. Um, which comes to the authoritative parent. Not what it sounds like. This is actually what we are striving for. This is the one that has the balance. Um, it does not mean we are a dictator and trying to control every action of our children, but we're striving to guide them through life, not just command them through life. Um, the Bible has a lot of good examples. Um, I kind of went to, to Solomon to start with. I will talk, we'll hold on to one part. Um, Solomon um, was trying to be a good father, I think. He was trying. I think he saw that David was uninvolved, and he didn't want that. And so he was trying to be, trying to be a good father. Um, now, he wasn't without his faults. He, he had his mistakes. But he records all of the instructions that he was trying to give to his son. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Um, honestly, in Proverbs, Solomon says, My son, 26 different times. He's trying to get his son's attention. And, and, and he wants to see his son be successful in his relationship with God and his relationship with the world. And he says, and that's going to be the rejoicing part of his heart. It says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 15, My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thy heart in the way. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing. It's just, I always like to look back at the language. Reins. My reins shall rejoice. I'm thinking reins for a horse. That's not what it means. <laughs> reins in the old English means your kidneys. Um, <laughs> different cultures um, have different ways of expressing um, yearnings. And so what he's saying is, is my guts, my heart. This is what he's, it's really what he's saying is my heart. It, it, it's the seat of our affections. This is where we show our love. And so it's just like with the kidneys, um, apparently. Um, but in simpler terms, he said he would rejoice in seeing his son walking with God, speaking and doing the right things. That would be the thrill of his heart. My son, give me thine heart that I can rejoice. Um, 3 John chapter, or, yeah, 3 John verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Um, uh, Lindsay Bell says, the goal of parenting isn't to create perfect kids. <laughs> nope. Uh, it's to point our kids to the perfect God. Um, and, and I think we've talked about this. I think that first thing, that first thing we have to start with is teaching them to love God. Because once we get to that point, if they love God, the rest of it becomes a lot easier. Like I said, I think Solomon kind of watched David and decided that that's not the parenting style he wanted. Um, but again... He wasn't without his struggles. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, My son, give me thy heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, 300 wives, 700 concubines, or is it the other way around? 700 wives, 300 concubines. 300 wives, yeah, 700 concubines. I understand it was politically motivated, but those 300 wives turned his heart away from God. The Bible tells us that. Observe my ways. If you're going to tell your children to observe your ways, make sure your ways are right. Um, 
Yeah, he says, give me thine heart, let thine eyes observe my ways. That word, the Hebrew word for observe, is actually two Hebrew words. It means to delight in and obey. Um, the greatest sermon isn't words, but action. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Be the example. <laughs> How many of you remember our ice storm back at the end of January? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, his dad tells a story. He was out there trying to break up the ice on his driveway so he could go to work. So he's out there and he didn't have anything, so he grabbed his son's baseball bat. So he's out there breaking up the ice. Gets the ice broken up, gets it pushed out and everything. Decided to take a break, go inside and get a cup of coffee. Well, his seven-year-old son was out there helping him. He left him out there. Son comes in and says, hey, Dad, I got the ice off the car. Dad says, well, how'd you do that? The same way you did with the bat. <laughs> yeah. Bad news. Uh, yeah, make sure that you're leading them the right way. Um, Robert Fulgham, I love this, says, don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Yeah, and they are. Your children are always watching. Your grandchildren are always watching. <laughs> um, I think I shared this way back on the first week. My granddaughter, who is now going to be 16 in August, has uh, probably when she was about seven, eight years old. We were on video, because they'd lived down in Colorado. We were on video at Christmas time, watching them open their gifts, and just talking and everything, and then you know, they're kind of playing and everything. We were talking with my daughter, and all of a sudden I said, I don't know what, it was, I don't even remember what the conversation was about. What I do remember is I said the word stupid. And my daughter who was down here playing, or my granddaughter was down here playing, all of a sudden went like this. She just stood right up, walked over, to my daughter, whispered in her ear, looked back at me, whispered in her ear again, and then turned around and walked off. And I went, ah, oh, what did I just do? Because, I mean, when she looked at me, I mean, you could see the expression on her face was like, and so I looked at my daughter and I said, what just happened? She says, well, we, we've taught our kids that the word stupid is not really a nice word to use. So she was just a little shocked to see Papa using that word. You know what that means? I felt about this big, just like deflated. Because I don't ever want to lead my grandkids or my kids in a way that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if my daughter's going to parent that way, then I want to follow. And it's just like, but man, they're watching. I mean, they're, she's down there playing. I, I'm, I, she just stood right up and went straight. And I'm going, what? They're watching. They're listening. Don't, think that, don't ever think that they're not listening. They're always listening. Okay? They are always listening. We've got to be the example. That's why Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. We have to be the guide. We have to be training. Um, conclusion, our parenting style may need a valuation. Maybe we need to evaluate. What are we doing? Um, start by making sure we're on the same page with husband or wife. We're in cohesion. Uh, making sure we're not creating a situation that they can manipulate. Uh, we need to lean on the Lord for His direction, raising our children. Can we claim a familiar passage we strive to point our children to God? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord. With all thine heart, lean not unto thy own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. I think that can apply to parenting, too. Um, I found this interesting, and I just kind of conclude with this. Paul David Tripp says, So your hope as a parent is not found in your power, your wisdom, your character, your experience, your success, but in this one thing alone, the presence of your Lord. The Creator, the Savior, the Almighty, the, the Sovereign King is with you. Let your heart rest. You are not in this parenting drama alone. Your potential is greater than the size of your weakness because the one who is without weakness is with you. And he does his best work through those who admit they are weak, but in weakness still heed his call. Yeah, we're not alone in this. We are not alone in this. God is right there with us. Um, he's the great father. Um, and actually, that's going to be probably the final lesson as we'll look at how God parents. And so I was just like, but it's a good time to just evaluate. So how am I doing? It <laughs> doesn't hurt to say, okay, how am I doing? Lord, help me analyze what I'm doing here. See where we're at. And if we need to adjust, adjust. 
And he's just like, find that balance. That's the most important thing. Find that balance. And then, like I said, for every kid, it's different. But we can find that and we can, we can do what God wants us to do. And that's raise up godly children seeking Him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for the examples that you give us in the Bible. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Uh, we're not in this alone. We, we can trust in you to help us and guide us as we try to point our children to you, first for salvation, but then to walk with you in a life that's pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Uh, we just want to be parents that honor you in raising our children. We're just going to thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen.